Hello everyone, today I'm going to talk about the normal physiology behind sleep. Okay, so this webinar will be divided into two parts. I will start with the electroencephalographic features of the different stages of wake and sleep. Then I will look into the mechanisms governing normal sleep. So depending on the EEG criteria, we can go through two types of sleep patterns during each night that alternate with each other. They are namely slow wave sleep because in this type of sleep, e, the EEG waves are generally of a low frequency. It is also called non-rapid eye movement sleep um, because unlike the other types of sleep, it is not associated with rapid eye movements. And then we have REM sleep or rapid eye movement sleep, which is a type of sleep in which a person makes rapid uh, um, movements of their eyes. In spite of the fact that the person is sleeping, the EEG typically has features of an awake person. Okay, so non-REM slow wave sleep is divided into three stages. Stages three and four are now collectively known as N3 sleep. So with stage one non-REM, it is noted when a person initially falls asleep. It is characterized by low amplitude fast background activity with vertex sharp transients, as well as RMDD, which is short for rhythmic, rhythmical mid-temporal theta discharges. Stage 2 non-REM is marked by the appearance of beds, which is short for benign epileptic form transients of sleep, as well as posts, or otherwise known as positive occipital sharp transients, and there can be noted sleep spindles. These spindles are bursts of alpha-like activity with a frequency rate of 10 to 14 Hz, and they can sometimes have an amplitude of up to 50 microvolts. The appearance of K-complexes is regarded as one of the futures signaling the onset of stage into sleep, and therefore they should normally occur against a generally slow background, usually in the theta range. Stage N3 non-REM, otherwise known as slow wave sleep, is previously subdivided into two stages, which had the following characteristics on the EEG. In stage 3, um, they, they are a lower frequency, mainly in the theta a range of background activity, which was differentiated from stage 4 that had the appearance of even slower frequencies, mainly in the delta activity range, and these waves typically had a higher amplitude. And then finally, REM sleep is marked by a low voltage fast activity that resembles an awake person. Okay, so we're going to start off with the first stage of sleep. As the first stage of sleep sets in, drowsiness occurs and the eyelids begin to droop. The eyes may rove slowly from side to side and the pupils become smaller. As this early stage of sleep evolves, the muscles start to relax and the EEG pattern changes to one of a progressively lower voltage and mixed frequency pattern with a loss of alpha waves. It consists ma mainly about 5% of sleep. It is the lighter stage of sleep and sleepers in stage 1 are easily aroused. As we enter stage 1 of sleep, predictable changes are seen in the posterior dominant rhythm. Alpha rhythm becomes less prominent and the distribution may transiently move forward in the head before it disappears or drops out. Uh, generally, beta activity may become prominent as this occurs. It may be associated with the characteristic changes in eye movements such as mini blinks and slow roving eye movements, which is highlighted in yellow as the, um, as the as the eyes move, uh, rose from side to side. Okay, so stage 2 of sleep is marked by biparietal 12 to 14 Hz wave. Uh, these are called sleep spindles on a low voltage background and intermittent high amplitude. Central parietal sharp slow wave complexes, and these are called K complexes. It takes about 50% of sleep time and is the most common stage of sleep in adults. In stage 2, we have K-complexes and sleep spindles on a background of theta rhythm. This is another example of K-complex and sleep spindles. It is important to remember that K-complexes can also indicate an arousal rhythm together with vertex sharp transients and, and hypnopompic hypersynchrony. So stages 3 and 4 are now collectively known as slow wave sleep or delta sleep. These two stages are not seen in isolation and is composed of an increased proportion of high amplitude delta waves. It marks 20% of our sleep time and in these stages people are not easily aroused and muscle tone is diminished. With age, the deeper stages of sleep are rather shorter. I will explain the, the mechanisms behind this a little bit later. 
So in stages three and four, we have the appearance of these high amplitude uh, delta waves um, that we can see here in this EEG montage. So slow wave sleep is an exceedingly restful type of sleep. It is associated with a decrease in peripheral vascular resistance. There's a noted 10 to 30% decrease in blood pressure, a decrease in respiratory rate, as well as basal metabolic rate. Sometimes it can be associated with dreams and nightmares, but it's more characteristic of REM sleep though. It has been noted that people usually do not have recollection of their dreams and when they're, when they're woken up during this stage of sleep, as opposed to REM awakenings. So REM sleep, which follows non-REM intermittently throughout the night, is associated with a further reduction in muscle tone, except in the extraocular muscles, and is associated with bursts of rapid eye movements. The EEG becomes desynchronized. In other words, it has a low voltage, high frequency discharge pattern. The first cycle of REM usually occurs 60 to 90 minutes after the onset of non-REM. The normal sleeper experiences four to or five REM episodes each night. The initial episode is usually short, only lasting five minutes in duration, whereas the later episodes are much longer, which can take up to 60 minutes in duration. So REM sleep is not divided into stages, but it is rather described in terms of its tonic and phasic components. The tonic aspects of REM sleep include the activi activated EEG patterns, similar to that of stage 1 sleep, which may exhibit increased activity in the theta range, with a generalized atonia of skeletal muscles, except for the extraocular muscles and the diaphragm. The phasic features of REM include irregular bursts of rapid eye movements and muscle twitches. As we can see here on this EEG pattern of REM sleep, we can appreciate these sawtooth waves on a relatively low voltage mixed frequency EEG background activity. Okay, so to summarize these findings, I'd like to remind you that even during wake, our EEG can look very different depending on whether our eyes are open or closed. So during sleep, stage one is characterized by a loss of alpha rhythm and stage two is characterized by two features, namely sleep spindles and K complexes. Any EEG you see which has one of these two features is by definition stage two sleep. Stage three is characterized by slow oscillations in the delta wave range, which is less than four hertz. And then REM sleep, which is one on the bottom of the slide, looks very much like an awake EEG where there is a low amplitude mixed frequency, mixed frequencies that is usually desynchronized. On the other feature of REM sleeps are, the, are those of sawtooth waves, which you can see here on the bottom of the presentation. So what happens to our body during non-REM sleep? You can think of this as a recovery stage for the body. There's an increased parasympathetic tone, the heart rate is slow and regular, as well as slow and regular respirations. And metabolism is reduced throughout the body, particularly in the cortex. Muscle tone is reduced relative to wake wakefulness, although we are not paralyzed during non-REM sleep. There's decrease in responsiveness. And the endocrinology of non-REM sleep is such that the growth hormone and proactin is released, specifically during the slow wave of non-REM sleep. Hence, people who get older and have less slow wave sleep also have less growth hormone and the release of less prolactin. Okay, in contrast to non-REM sleep, REM sleep has several unique features. First of all, the EEG is highly desynchronized, much like what we saw in a wake person. The muscle tone is paralyzed, this EMG atonia, with the exception of a few muscles that maintain tone, and which, of course, one group of muscles is that of rapid eye movements. Another one is in the middle ear, and then, of course, the diaphragm. So we're able to breathe during this stage of sleep. Our body tends to drift between ambient temperatures during this stage, and this is termed then as polycothermia, and penile tumescence happens during REM sleep. There's also an increase in cerebral blood flow. If you plant deep electrodes in the brain, for example, in patients who undergo deep electrodes for epilepsy monitoring, you'll record these pontogeniculate occipital waves during REM sleep, which are named after the three sites where you can detect these waves. Okay, so looking at the sleep architecture, we can see that the sleep architecture in the young is highly, highly characteristic. 
When we fall asleep, we go through increased deaths of non-REM sleep. And in the first stage that we enter early in the night, we see slow wave sleep. This is characteristic of deep non-REM sleep stages 3 and 4, now collectively known as slow wave sleep, as I've mentioned. As the night progresses, we go through these alternating cycles of REM sleep and non-REM sleep, separated by, by 90 to 120 minute intervals. Note that REM sleep always occurs after stage 2, non-REM sleep. Therefore, we can say N2 goes to REM. And remember, we pay back slow wave sleep early in the night. In contrast to the typical architecture in young adults, as we age, there are a number of changes that happen in our sleep, or sleep architecture. The first is that we have less REM sleep overall compared to our younger counterpart years. The second is that we don't need as much deep sleep stages, three non-REM sleep. And lastly, we can see there's an increase in sleep fragmentation as we age that is characterized with more nocturnal awakenings. The different differences between young adults and older adults can be shown summarized in this slide, which is also incorporates babies and children. Here, the most prominent change you see from infancy is that during infancy, we have quite a bit of sleep and about 50% of our sleep is REM sleep. Whereas as we age, the percentage of REM sleep reduces significantly to only about 4%. There's a gradual reduction in sleep overall as we age, with the exception that during adolescence, there's a slight increase in the non-REM sleep pattern. As we get older, there's a steady decline in sleep overall. I'm now going to talk about the neuroanatomy and neurochemistry basis of sleep regulation. So these studies started with the Austrian neurologist Konstantin von Economo. Uh, who performed clinical pathological correlations on patients that he treated for either insomnia or for hypersomnolence. And what he noticed was that patients who were extremely hypersomnolent, for example, in patients who had sequelae of diseases that went through Europe called encephalitis lethargica, these patients had lesions in the midbrain region at the junction between the diencephalon and the mesencephalon. In contrast to patients who are insomniacs who had lesions in the anterior diencephalon, namely the anterior thalamus and the anterior hypothalamus. And based upon this, he proposed that the centers that regulate sleep are regulated um, either here in the midbrain or in the diencephalon. Okay, so this table shows the understanding of the neuroanatomical and neurochemical basis of sleep regulation. And this has formulated our understanding that has accumulated through virtually a century of research. I'm not going, I'm not going to go through this table in detail, but as we, we can broadly appreciate these differences here. Okay, so on this slide, I'm showing you some of these neurotransmitters in graphical form. So the key thing here to remember is that the control of wakefulness is distributed among several nuclei and several neurotransmitters. Uh, this group of nuclei in the brainstem that promote wakefulness are located in what is known as the ascending reticular activating system. And it has that name because if you stimulate um, anywhere in the brainstem region, you can get activation of the cortex. Early studies on this activation, activation suggest that these nuclei were found in the reticular pattern. It is useful to remember that several neurotransmitters are wake promoting and they fall into the categories known as monoamines. These are located in the histaminergic neurons. Histamine is secreted in the posterior hypothalamus, serotonin in the raphae nuclei, norepinephrine in the lucus ceruleus, and dopamine is found in, in the ventral tegmental area, as well as in the periaqueductal gray areas. In addition to the monoamines, there is a neuropeptide called orexin, which is highly wake promoting. They, uh, there are also cholinergic neurons, which are wake promoting, and glutamate, which are strongly wake promoting. Most of these project directly into the cortex, with the exception of acetylcholine, which projects to the thalamus, which is a wake promoting on the thalamic nuclei. In contrast to the highly wake promoting system, the sleep promoting system, at least as we understand it today, is far simpler. There is a single nucleus located in the preoptic region of the hypothalamus, the ventral lateral preoptic um, spe part specifically. This nucleus contains the neuropeptide called gallamine and the classical neurotransmitter GABA. 
and these VLPO neurons project to, to all of the wake promoting neurons that I just talked about and subsequently inhibit them. So recently, a new sleep promoting center was identified in the brainstem at the junction between the medulla and the pons, and this is known as the parafacial zone. How the parafacial zone connects to these wake promoting neurons and interacts with them is still an active area of research. The key thing to remember is that both of these nuclei use the classical neurotransmitter GABA to control their activities. And finally, I should say this, that there's also another sleep promoting chemical called adenosine. And the reason this rele is relevant to medicine and most of us here on this webinar is that for those who drink coffee is that adenosine receptor is blocked by the action of caffeine. So one thought about why caffeine is so strongly wake promoting is that there, uh, there's a blocking of the somnogenic effects of this neurochemical um, adenosine. I'm now going to talk about the two processes that regulate sleep. You can think of them as mechanistically independent processes. The first is a clock-like process, which has a periodicity of about 24 hours. You cannot change how fast that clock ticks. All you can do is to reset it. And I'll talk about how it's reset by light in the next few slides. The other process is not a clock-dependent process, but rather a homeostatic process, which has to do with how long we've been awake. The longer we stay awake, the more likely we are to flip into sleep. You can figuratively think of this process as an hourglass. The hourglass is more likely to flip into sleep if enough sand passes through it. Very little is known about this homeostatic process, and I won't talk much more about it. And I will now focus more primarily on the circadian processes during the rest of the presentation. But before I move on, I first want you to think of these processes interacting as follows. As you wake up in the morning at 7 a.m., you have just had a full night of sleep. And then as the day progresses and you stay awake and your sleep need increases linearly. This is called the process S, or in other words, the homeostatic process. However, you don't fall asleep right away because your circadian process, which is an alerting process, starts to wake you up about midday and keeps you awake up until 11 o'clock at night when your circadian process starts to decrease its wakefulness effect and your homeostatic process starts to build up a sleep need. You now have to fall asleep. And now, as we can see, you can now replenish the sleep need you have. This cycle then keeps on repeating itself. Okay, so let's talk about the circadian process that I've promised. So not only is our sleep-wake cycle controlled by the circadian or internal clock, but our numerous physiological processes are controlled by this clock. And some of these are shown on this slide. So the first is the fluctuation in blood pressure. Our blood pressures are not constant throughout the day. Normally, our blood pressure dips at night and it starts to rise again at around 7 a.m. And it has a peak in the evening at around 6 p.m. This is relevant because so many of the diseases we, that we treat are vascular diseases and are a consequence of blood pressure dysregulation. I should also point out that our greatest cardiovascular efficiency and muscle strength occurs in the late afternoon. Okay, so just a quick question, and this has to do with the circadian clock, is that ischemic strokes are most likely to occur at which time of the day? And the answer is usually between 6 a.m. to noon. And this is an observation was based on this meta-analysis in this paper by Elliot in 1998. This is probably a combination of blood pressure fluctuations during this time period, as well as changes in platelet activation in the morning. The question is often asked, what is the normal human circadian period? And if I put you in a dark cave without any light or time cues, what would you be, be your approximate rhythm? And how often would you have a wake drive? And how often would you have a sleep drive? And the answer is that it is variable between individuals. But in general, the period is very close to a 24 hour period. And that's where the word circadian comes from. But there are variations between individuals, and on average, most people have a period that is a little bit longer than 24 hours. And as we can see in this graph here, anywhere between 24 and 24 and a half hours can occur. And the consequence of the fact that we have a slightly longer period is if we're not exposed to light on a daily basis, 
our natural internal clock will drive us, us to have a slightly increased delay every single day, maybe as little as 20 minutes to 30 minutes delay. But if we are not exposed to light in the morning, this will continue to drift and lead us to have trouble getting to sleep at night and waking up in the morning as we would, uh, as, as we would like to. The other point about this slide is, as we get older, we do have disrupted sleep and older individuals often go to sleep earlier and wake up earlier. But th this is not due to a change in the circadian period because they still have identical periods to the, their younger counterparts. Rather, it is a change in their phase at which they sleep and the phase in which they stay awake. So here's a question about aging on circadian rhythms. The question is, the tendency to go to sleep and wake up early in older individuals can be explained by which mechanism? And the answer is the advancement of the phases of the circadian clock with age. The components of the circadian system include an input component, which is also known as a time giver, or the German for word for it is Zeitgeber. And in the primary time giver for our central clock, or the only time given our central clock is light. The, this acts on the central pacemaker or an oscillating clock. And, in, and then there's an output of the clock, uh, which includes the sleep weight cycle, as well as our physiological features, which have been talked about on the prior slides. While the central clock is regulated only by light, you will see by what I mean by this in a minute, there are other inputs to other clocks in the body that can affect the timing of this central clock, namely liver activity and muscle strength. And this also has to do with exercise, noise, meals and temperature. So let's talk more about the central oscillator. The molecular mechanisms by which our central circadian clock works is remarkably well understood. The oscillator consists of both a positive limb, a pair of transcriptive factors called clock and BMAL. There's also a negative limb, uh, which is a pair of transcriptional outputs called period and cryptochrome. Clock and BMAL promote the transcription of these two genes, period and cryptochrome. The mRNA for these two genes is transported by the cytoplasm, where it is translated into proteins. And the proteins then feed back into the nucleus to inhibit the activity of the transcription factors, clock and BMAL, and therefore complete this loop. So this pro is also known as the transcriptional translational feedback loop. So the clinical correlation of this process is that there are patients with unusually early circadian phases. They actually have a fast period, a period that only lasts 22 hours, and these patients have variants or mutations in a gene called period 2, which is an integral part of this clock. And then there are other patients with mutations in the gene called cytochrome, as well as those with mutations in casein kinase 1 epsilon, which can be seen on the left corner of the screen. Uh, which is, This is an enzyme that regulates the stability of the protein in the cytoplasm. So the next component of the circadian clock that I would like to talk about is the input, the Zeitgeber. So this slide shows you an overview of how the light affects our central clock, the suprachiasmatic nucleus. So light comes in through the retina or through our eyes. Uh, there's obviously no other way for light to get into the body aside from our eyes. And this information travels via the retinal hypothalamic tract to the suprachiasmatic nucleus which then sends information down the spinal cord and through the superior cervical ganglion back up to a tiny nucleus situated in the back of the brain, in the pineal gland, which then releases melatonin. Uh, melatonin can then weakly provide feedback to affect the phase of the suprachiasmatic nucleus. So more on that in a minute, let's talk about light. So light affects our circadian clocks by two mechanisms. The first mechanism is via the detection of light by the classical photoreceptors, cells, rods and cones. These are also used for perceptual vision. But there are also some of the other photoreceptors in the cell, which are found in the, our retinal ganglion cells. And these are known as intrinsically photosensitive sensitive retinal ganglion cells, which expresses a molecule called melanopsin. 
and this information together from the rods and melanopsin travel via the retinal hypothalamic tract and synapse onto the neurons of the suprachiasmatic nucleus. These neurons in the RHT, the retinal hypothalamic tract, uses glutamate as their classical neurotransmitters and a neuropeptide called pituitary adenylated cyclase activating polypeptide or PACAP to stimulate the suprachiasmatic neurons. I want to say one more word about melanopsin. So melanopsin was discovered only about 15 to 20 years ago. It is found in a special population of retinal ganglion cells which respond to light with a calcium flux. So here you can see a flash of light and the, as time progresses you can see this activation which is shown by this red and yellow in these retinal ganglion cells. Um, this special class of retinal ganglion cells explains, explains why some blind people who cannot perceive light because of a degeneration of their rods and cones, but the circadian clock can still be entrained to light in the dark cycle because they still have intact retinal ganglion cells. Melanopsin responds best to blue light, so if you're trying to give a patient instructions how to maximize resetting of their clock on a daily basis, that light that they should get exposed to is in the blue range of precisely 40, 479 nanometers. So again, here's a quick question. As we can see, the circadian clock of blind individuals who are blind due, spe due specifically to generation of the rods and cones can still be entrained by light because of the action of mel melanopsin cells. So let's again look at the schematic for how light entrains the circadian clock. And now I want to focus more on the role of melatonin. Remember that the suprachiasmatic nucleus of the hypothalamus is the master clock. It is located above the optic chiasm. The suprachiasmatic nucleus regulates the pineal gland, which is an endocrine gland located posterior to the, to the thalamus. And in the pineal gland, it secretes the hormone called melatonin, which is a metabolite of the serotonin during darkness. Melatonin in humans is weakly sleep promoting, and this is the reason why individuals use it as a sleeping aid but actually it is only a very weak sleeping aid. Its primary effect is to slightly advance the circadian clock. Blue light suppresses melatonin production by activation of the heritinal hypothalamic tract, which I just talked about, and then affects the suprachiasmatic nucleus back onto the pineal gland. So melatonin goes up during darkness. Also known, it is also known as the hormone of darkness. The secretion of melatonin begins two to three hours before bedtime. And in fact, you can use the onset of melatonin secretion as a measure of the phase of circadian cl clock. Melatonin weakly feeds back to reset the circadian clock through melatonin receptors located in the suprachiasmatic nucleus. This action of melatonin onto the clock is the basis of the, the, for the development of numerous drugs that are used clinically. These are both melatonin receptor agonists. The final synapse between the neurons that leave the superior cervical um, ganglion and synapse onto the pineal gland is an adrenergic synapse and therefore people who take beta blockers have a dampened melatonin rhythm because beta blockers suppresses this melatonin release. And as I said before, melatonin is a weak, weak hypnotic but it can phase advance the eternal clock if you take it in, uh, in the afternoon. So I would like to summarize normal sleep, and that is that sleep is regulated by both circadian and homeostatic processes. So the circadian regulation of sleep is relatively well understood, both at the level of the light input pathways and at the core cellular oscillators. In contrast, the homeostatic regulation of sleep remains poorly understood. There are multiple awake systems that are potentially redundant, but one explanation for the reason that there are so many different awake systems is that each may serve as a unique function. In other words, not all wake is the same. And remember the monoamines plus acetylcholine, glutamate and orexin are wake promoting. The non-REM sleep control has two identified systems, the ventrolateral preoptic and the parafacial zones. But there are likely other inputs to the system, such as that from the basal forebrain as well. I didn't talk much about the circuitry of REM sleep, but I will say to you just remember that REM sleep is not simply a reduction in monomergic tone, but it has an active inhibitory process in the pawns, where we, most, we are mostly paralyzed during sleep. 
This entire system is delicate and can be disturbed by medication, stresses, illnesses and age. Finally, you can see sleep is required for life, which is observed in every animal that has ever been studied carefully. Yet, why we sleep remains a central biological mystery. And that will conclude the end of my presentation. Thank you for listening. You can see the references noted down here. And a big thank you for the EEG online course for giving me nice examples regarding the EEG patterns noted in sleep.